everybody. Last week I drove an example of an early Cayman S, the 987.1, and I declared it just about all the Porsche or sports car anybody would ever need. Today, Big Brother fights back, for I am driving what could be the best example of a 996 generation 911 out there. This will be good. by now everybody is familiar with the story but just to do a quick recap the 996 generation of 911 was introduced in 1997 to replace the 993 it was a much needed update as the old car could trace its roots all the way back to the inception of the 911 in the 1960s so by the end that was still a much loved vehicle it was a little bit odd in terms of ergonomics and struggling to meet then ever more restrictive noise and emissions regulations the 996 was a a ground up redesign with new chassis, new engine, new interior, the works. Unfortunately for Porsche, though it was certainly a much needed car, it was also one that came with a few issues, including, in no particular order, the fact that it shared a great number of its parts, in fact just about everything from the doors forward, with the then also new Boxster. And people weren't happy about that because it meant if you had paid full up for the top model 911, you were essentially still getting many of the parts of the much cheaper entry level car. Said parts also included new headlights, which ditched the classic round look of old 911s and went for a style that became known as the fried eggs. This one I'm driving today has a slightly different take on the design with clear indicators, so technically not fried eggs anymore. However, I think it was a pretty big mistake on Porsche's part. 911 headlights are a design icon and to change them was foolish. In addition, the interior, though nice and certainly an upgrade in some ways over the old cars, just wasn't quite good enough. Remember, these were about £15,000 more than an M3 of the day, yet from in here didn't feel noticeably better. And though 911 purists were never going to be happy with the water-cooled engine, it turned out that this one, the M96, and its successor, the M97, did have a few serious issues. IMS, RMS failure, bore scoring, and uh, I'm sure plenty of other problems too. And so it didn't take very long after the cars had come out for prices to drop, because nobody wanted to buy a vehicle that they knew might require a very expensive engine rebuild at any point in the near future. Unfortunately, the nature of the problems with this car meant that there wasn't really any preventative maintenance you could do. You just had to sit there and wait for a very, very big bill. So bad was the 996's reputation for fragility that it even affected the prices of the GT3 and the Turbo, which actually had an entirely different engine, the Metzger Lump. About 12 years ago, you could pick up a decent working running example of a 996 C2 Coupe in manual for eight or nine thousand pounds. Turbos I saw go for around the 20,000 pound mark and GT3s you could pick up for about 30 to 35. Today, things are very different. The 996 is slowly becoming a little bit more appreciated. It began, I think, really with the GT3s. The price of those was dragged up by the increasing desirability of the later models. And now you're going to pay nearly as much for a 996 GT3 as you would a 997. Evidently, people have now finally begun to believe those of us who've been telling everyone that the 996 really is a genuinely brilliant driver's car and a proper 911. The current darling of the 996 world, though, seems to be the C4S. Note for this generation there was no C2S, and the C4S followed the same template as many others with the same name. So, it had the wider body from a turbo, but without the air intakes, and evidently I'm not alone in admiring the looks of the car, because I can't actually think of any other reason as to why they've become so valuable. They don't have any more power or performance compared with a regular C4 or C2, but they do carry a bit of extra weight. Though I have seen up for just over £30,000, which is not all that much less than you'd pay for an entry-level turbo. Those seem to start at around the £40,000 mark.
However, by the time you're talking about that kind of money, you have a lot of other choice, including a selection of other Porsches, and that's to say nothing of the likes of an early Audi R8, an Aston Martin V8 Vantage, a Lotus Evora, so on and so forth. And that is why today I am delighted to be taking a look at this, a base model early pre-facelift 3.4 litre Carrera 2. Because even with used car prices at a record high, these are still relatively affordable. To give you an example, an E46 M3, which back in the day would have been a competitor, and when new, quite a bit cheaper, now commands a lot more. One of those, in manual coupe guys, you're looking at really a start price of 25 grand. One of these, it's 15. And I think there's a huge amount to be said for the car. Although, when it comes to luxuries, it is a little bit short. In fact, these early cars didn't even give you a glove box. If you want to park your owner's manual, you do that by putting it in a little slot just down here below the column. As per 911 tradition, the engine in these early cars was a flat six boxer, which in Carrera guys was naturally aspirated and first displaced 3.4 litres, and that rose to 3.6 with the facelift. Power and torque figures were both relatively modest even for the day. 296 horses and around 258 pound foot. It's about 320 newton meters. But the relative lack of luxury, and the fact these were developed in the 90s, means that engine doesn't have a lot to drag around. They are some of the lightest 911s going. Real world curb weight, 1,350 kilos. To give some context, that's about 30 kilos lighter than a Ferrari Challenge Stradale. There was a choice of two gearboxes, a five-speed Mercedes-Benz derived Tiptronic or this, the six-speed manual that of course is the choice of the purist. In spite of modest price increases in the last few years, these have remained one of the most affordable ways to get yourself into a Porsche sports car. The only ones being cheaper than this would be a very early Cayman or a Boxster of the day. And the simple fact is, a 911 is always going to command a little bit more. But still, over all of these cars looms a very large shadow in the form of those engine issues. And so, when this car's owner, Lee, decided to go looking for a 911 of this age, he made, I think, a very sensible decision. He purchased a car which already had a broken engine. This one was on about 80 odd thousand miles and has had just the two owners before him. The first had it for about 80 months and the second for some 20 years. And that second owner unfortunately experienced something that I've often talked about, which is that he bought a very low mileage car and then didn't drive it all that much. So in 2009, when it was already a 10 year old car, but it had just 30,000 miles put on it, the engine failed. A piston went exactly in what way, I do not know, but we have some documentation saying that's what happened and he got it fixed. Sadly, what he did when he fixed it was he had that piston replaced. And so another 10 years down the line and about 50,000 miles on, that imbalance between one nice new piston and five somewhat older ones got to the point where it, um, well, broke the engine. And Lee bought this car because he did exactly what I've often said to people to do. He picked up a car which was in generally fairly good condition, had seen plenty of maintenance in the past, but had a pretty big serious issue with the engine because then he could get it sorted his way. And he did exactly what I think all of us petrol heads would do. He took it to Hartek, who here in the UK are the people for doing 911 rebuilds and had it not just rebuilt, but upgraded because you could have had the car redone as a 3.4 as it had always been, but instead he went for their slightly larger 3.7 litre conversion. And that's what this car is now. The difference in torque and power is significant. By default, these are 300 horses, 258 pound foot. This one is now 300 pound foot, and it comes in slightly earlier and in a slightly smoother fashion, and 335 horsepower. And you notice it. The early 
3.4s were always credited with being a slightly more rev-happy engine than the later 3.6s. Those had a lot more mid-range punch but lacked the top-end fireworks. This has the best of both worlds. And Lee was told by the people at Hartek that this is probably one of the healthiest examples they've ever seen. Hartek aren't really very good at giving concrete numbers, and I can understand exactly why. You just don't want to commit to anything when there are so many variables. But this, they say, probably made some of the best numbers because it is set up just right. In other words, the intake and exhaust is entirely standard, barring some 200-cell sports cats. I've seen and driven many of these where people have mucked about with the intake and the exhaust. The simple fact is, most of the time, what you do is ruin it. Particularly if you try and put an X-pipe or something in the exhaust and make it a little bit more free-flowing, what tends to happen is you rob the car of all the mid-range and maybe you give it a little bit more top end, but I think what actually happens is you just feel the relative lack of torque a little bit more. This is absolutely sublime. More than that, though, Lee has resisted the temptation to upgrade every single other aspect of the car. When searching for what 911 to buy, he drove a few of these, and very early on, he discounted any with the M030 sport suspension. And rightly so. This car is riding on the optional 18-inch wheels with a nice new set of Pirellis on. And it's perfect. Absolutely perfect. It's still a little on the firm side. It feels like a sports car or how people expect a sports car to be, but it's not crashy. It's not harsh. It's not overly firm. And it has that proper, proper 911 feel about it. Nice and light steering once you press on. The chassis moves about. You can feel, certainly, that it's very rear biased, but it's a 911. It should be. There's still plenty of grip, and the pace is wonderful. The brakes are typical old-school Porsche, so the pedal needs a bit more of a shove than you might expect, but you actually begin to really rather appreciate that. They respond beautifully. The suspension is still the original M029 specification, just with newer, fresher components. He's gone through the entire car and replaced just about anything you can conceive of. Likewise, the brakes, they're new, but to original specification. And the car is so good for it. I've said many times that it frustrates me to see people spending a fortune on aftermarket coilovers when what the car actually needed was just a new set of bushes. I think it's because coilovers sound so much sexier than bushes, but people don't want to spend on them when that's actually the source of the problem. This car has a short shift gearbox in it with a 997 lever, and the action is fabulous. The boxes in these do tend to wear, and not all of them have a great gear shift, but they can, and they should. Oh, this is so good. One unusual thing that Lee chose to do with this car is when working on the gearbox, he omitted to refit much of the noise insulation down here. So you do actually get quite a bit of transmission noise in the car, and um, I actually kind of like it. It's not too intrusive, you don't get it all the time, but it does make the whole thing feel just a little bit more mechanical. Visibility out, classic 911, really good. You've got those little haunches there, plenty of glass in this so you can see just about everything. This being a C2, you've still got a relatively decent boot, and of course you do have two token back seats which are mostly useful for carrying crates of beer rather than people. Today, the 996 also seems to have taken the place of the old 3.2 and 3-litre cars as the donor vehicle of choice for Porsche-related projects. And um, I suppose it's only natural. People have now realised that 964s are far, far too good just to hack up, unless you want to build a Singer, apparently, but that's a, a whole other thing. But these do offer a lot of value for the money. They're considerably more modern, much easier to live with, and um, they're still relatively plentiful and easy to get a hold of. The fact that a GT3 is now 70 grand has also left a lot of room for the likes of RPM Technic to offer you something that does a very similar job at a little bit less money and built to your specific requirements. When you could pick up one of these for 10 and a GT3 for 35, why on earth would you spend 30 or 40 grand on a regular one? And unfortunately, the reality facing a great many of the 996s out there is that they are at that most difficult stage in their life cycle, where the cars are still relatively cheap, but if you want them to be as good as they can, you need to spend quite a bit of money on them. 
How much has Lee spent on this? Well, the engine work at Hardtech, if you want to do just a standard rebuild, that's usually about £10,000. To get the upgrade, you can add another two or three to that. However, he went a little bit beyond. In fact, here's the list of what he had done. The engine was fully stripped and broken down to its component parts, then rebuilt from the ground up. The engine was converted not just from 3.4 to 3.7 litres, but also to a closed deck setup. The new parts included pistons, rings, liners and bearings for both Conrod and Crank. There is a complete new timing chain set with the appropriate ancillaries and the car has also been upgraded to the later 2006 style intermediate shaft bearing, solving one of the engine's biggest flaws. The heads were decoked and skimmed, valves relapsed to fit the seats perfectly, and a new oil cooler, water pump and tensioners were also fitted. On Lee's car, a new starter motor, flywheel, slave cylinder and clutch were also supplied. The engine and gearbox mounts were also refreshed at the same time and other maintenance work was done too. The full build process has been documented on Lee's YouTube channel, but the cost of the initial work at Hartec came in at just under £23,000. On top of this, the car also had new tyres, shocks, various pieces done to the exhaust replacing corroded fixtures and fittings, as well as an overhaul of the air conditioning and the radiators. The suspension work was extensive, including front and rear dampers, various springs, mounts, arms and bolts. Barring the engine, much of the work done to the car has been by Friends Green Porsche, and all told, the spend on the vehicle is now in excess of £30,000, not including the original purchase price. For the same money, he could have had himself an Aston Martin V8 Vantage, DB9, Audi R8, Maserati Gran Turismo, possibly even a Ferrari 360. But what he has is, I think, just about the best 996 I've ever driven. It may still upset the odd purist, but to me, this really is a genuinely brilliant 911. Beautifully sized for the roads, nice, light, delicate feel and steering, just the right amount of power, just the right amount of noise. And here in silver over metropole blue, it's a very subtle specification to you'd never know by looking at it just how much money, attention and care has been lavished upon it. But I think that really does appeal to a certain type of petrol head because this is not about the showing off to your neighbours, this is just about the driving experience. And in those terms, it scores very, very highly indeed. I feel like I've done a terrible job today and I haven't really talked about an awful lot of things, but um, if you can think of anything that I've missed, hop into the comment section down below, ask me, and I'll try and give you an honest answer as I possibly can. But for now, I want to say a huge thank you to Lee for bringing his car out, and as ever, to you for watching. Don't forget to hit the like button, comment down below, and subscribe if you haven't already. I'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye.